Believe this or not, I was going to ask her to sing that. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. That's good. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. Stand the book. Stand this morning with me, please. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter number two. Acts chapter number two. Acts chapter number two. I hope you have a holy Bible in your hands. KJV 1611 is what I'm referring to. If you don't have a King James Bible, follow along with us, but there'll be a few places you get lost. Acts chapter number 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them, unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Galatia and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya round about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, the wonderful works of God, and they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Father, add your blessing to the reading of your word now, and give me unction to preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You just read about an event that took place 2,000 years ago that is recorded in the book of Acts that happened on the day of Pentecost. It had never happened before, nor has it ever happened since. It is a one-time event in history, but it's a very powerful thing. For on this day in the book of Acts chapter number 2, the church of God was given identity and birth. It was given the power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you took the Spirit of God outside of the church, all you'd have is a bunch of people getting together, reading about something that happened 2,000 years ago with no power. If you take the Holy Spirit of God outside the church, you'd have no conviction. If you take the Holy Spirit outside of the church of God, there'd be no presence of the body of Jesus Christ. If you took the Holy Ghost away, you'd never see anyone born again. Nobody would be saved. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the church would be impotent, have no ability to get anything done whatsoever. So what happened in Acts chapter number 2 was a fulfillment of prophecy. The Lord said, wait for the promise of the Father. And they did. The Bible says... And here's the key that I want to call your attention to. It says in chapter number 2 and verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. In verse number 46 of the same chapter, it says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread. So they had gotten together, these people from various stages and places in life, from different types of, uh, from, from different work and so forth and levels of education and culture and what have you. But one thing had brought them all together. And that was that they were in one accord. Now what accord do you suppose they were gathered together for this day? Do you believe they were here because they wanted to start some kind of a new religious movement? No. They had gathered together in the book of Acts chapter number 2 because they had been instructed to. He said for you to wait for the promise of the Father. And so the Bible says 120 of them had gathered together in an upper room, had been there for some time and no doubt had been praying night and day, waiting for the promise of the Father. In Acts chapter number 2, the promise of the Father showed up. For the Holy Spirit came down upon every one of these believers and baptized them in the Holy Ghost into the body of Jesus Christ. 
This body started breathing that day. It's still breathing today. For 2,000 years there has been an unbroken chain in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. True believers walking around on planet earth. Thank God for that. If the church had not been here for 2,000 years, can you imagine what kind of world this would be today? For it's bad enough the way it is. With the church here. Imagine what's going to happen when the church leaves. The scripture says in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. He that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. And may I add this. Then all hell breaks loose. So if you think you've seen something. You haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get a whole lot worse. When the church is gone. But the Bible said they were with one accord. They were with one accord because of who they believed in. They all believed in Jesus Christ. They were in one accord because they believed what He said to them. If they'd wait for the promise of the Father. They were in one accord because they waited in anticipation. They knew God was about to do something in their lives. They were in one accord because they were obedient to the command to be there. 120 waited for the very moment for the Lord Jesus Christ to send the power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you could get all the churches in America in one accord, in one place, at one time, can you imagine what God would do? I'm talking about people who are really born again. If they'd quit their bickering and their backbiting and their infighting and all the rest of this garbage and came together with one accord, you might be amazed at what God would do. If you could get this house right here with these people sitting right here at Temple Baptist Church in one accord, in one mind, you'd be amazed at what God could do. I've seen things happen here that literally blow my mind. They literally defy explanation. The way the power of God busted loose in here this morning, that is no accident. But God said that's what He's going to do at Temple Baptist Church and He's doing exactly what He said He'd do. If you'd get in one mind and one accord, you'd be amazed at how your life would begin to take on new meaning. If you literally got in one accord and one mind with the Holy Ghost and said, Lord, I'm going to quit playing church and playing in my faith and I'm going to quit playing with God and I'm going to take my faith seriously and start reading my Bible and praying and walking and living with God, that one accord would make a big difference in your life. This Bible says they were with one accord in one place. Would we come together? Together like that, I ask you today, I challenge you. At Temple Baptist Church, God's given us something special here. This is not something to be taken lightly. He's showing you and giving you a taste of what He's able to do. He has healed people in this house. He saved people in this house. We got a house full of drug addicts that used to be drug addicts and are not anymore. We got people in this house that were hell raisers and they're not hell raisers anymore. We got people sitting in here this morning that were drunks and you're not drunks anymore. Some of you chased everything that had a skirt. Now God saved your soul and you want to tell somebody about it. That's what we came together for. We came together to manifest the power of God. God. We're not in here to push anybody's religion. You're sick to death of that now. You've had it up to here. All of this political correct religion that's being do dosed out every day to man. We want to see something real and somebody alive and know that there's something real about what we preach and the power of the Holy Ghost is no joke, friend. <laughs> he is no joke. It is no joke to watch somebody transform from a child of hell into a child of God. It is no joke to get a letter like I did this past week from a man in southern Florida. He said, preacher, he said, I was hooked on methamphetamines. He said, I did everything. He said, I was hooked on one drug after another. And he said, I called upon God and cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he delivered me from every bit of it. He saved my soul, he said. He delivered me. I am no longer an addict to methamphetamines. I'm no longer an addict to heroin. I'm no longer an addict to crack cocaine. Came. I'm no longer an addict that I used to be. How? Because of the power of God. Amen. We could light candles, hang flowers. We could come in here and make this thing into some kind of a woo-woo looking religious place and really stir you up. But it wouldn't do you one bit of good for what's wrong with your soul. What you need is what happened in Acts chapter number 2. 
They were with one accord in one place. And the power of the Holy Ghost came down upon them. I used to be all those things. But I'm not anymore. I came from the wrong side of the tracks. But God saved my soul. I was born and raised in hell. But now I'm a child of God. Amen. Amen. So the Bible said the first church, the early church, the apostolic church, this ancient church, it started out right, friend. It had one accord in one place with one mind and one Jesus, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Now 2,000 years later, our churches look like a mixed mash, a magpie's nest of every piece of garbage you can imagine. Churches ordaining homosexuals, man sodomites together, and denying the virgin birth and the blood atonement and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've come a long way, baby. But I want you to know this morning, friend, I want you to know that the true church is still alive. It still is. It still is. He'll come anywhere. He's welcomed and invited in. Have you invited Him in? Have you cried out to Him and said, God, I need you in my life. Amen. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 4 he said this. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there's an awful lot of people out there that I don't doubt love the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't doubt it for a minute that they love Jesus Christ and they speak in what they think is an unknown tongue. But according to the book of Acts chapter number 2, the only unknown tongue in here is a language that can be discerned clearly by other people. Sixteen different languages are recorded in Acts chapter number 2. And the Bible said they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't let anybody ever browbeat you, condescend to you, patronize you and make you think that you don't have the power of God because you don't usher, uh, utter some kind of four, five, six, eight, ten syllables that make no sense to anybody whatsoever. If God gives you the gift of tongues, you will speak in a language that is discernible to somebody and there will be an interpreter there to interpret that language and God will be glorified. Amen. I want you to know something. Let me tell you something, my good old Baptist friends. There is a power that you can have. A power from God. A power that you need. This early church is populated with people who are hiding from the Jews. Peter denied him three times. The apostle Peter who gets up in Acts chapter number 2 and begins to preach to these people had quite a checkered background. On one hand he denies the Lord. But on the other the great day when he stood and said thou art the Christ. The Son of the living God was his greatest moment. It was when God revealed to Peter that that man before him was God Almighty standing there in flesh. He didn't get that from man. The Lord Jesus said Peter, Simon Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. I want you to know something. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. And I didn't get that from man. I got that from above. I believe that Bible. I believe that I need power. I believe that I need power. I know I need power. If I'm going to live for Jesus in this hell-bound, filthy, stinking, perverted culture that I've got to walk shoulders with day in and day out, I'd better have some power in my life. Every time you turn on that one-eyed sewer in your house, it pump its, pumps raw sewage right in your home. And the people you work with, live next door to, go to school with, live on a constant diet of raw sewage. The morality of our, my country, I hate to say, is nothing but pure raw sewage. My space. Facebook, Craigslist, and you name it over and over and over again, is reaching out to take hold of your children. It wants to ensnare them. It wants to suck them straight into its sewage. And it will do it in a heartbeat if you let it. Therefore, my Christian parents, you need the power of God in your family in your life and you need to learn how to say a little two letter word no <laughs> amen amen you can get
get on the internet and run it from Genesis to Revelation. And you won't find my mug on there one time. If it's on there, somebody else put it on there. I have to look at it enough. When I look in the mirror, I see all I care about seeing. Amen. It wakes me up every day. All I got to do is get a good look at this mug and I'm wide awake. So I have no desire to broadcast myself, stick myself out in front of people, make people know who I am. But I can understand how little impressionable children want to get on the internet and they want to socially communicate with each other. And if you poor old gray-headed people in here this morning don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you're living 50 years ago. We live in an informational age where when the internet and computers, our kids are being bombarded day in and day out with every kind of unimaginable filth there is. It's not that. If that was enough, it'd be bad enough. But they are being watched, stalked, and observed by predators that will rob them, kidnap them, steal them out of their cars, take them out of your houses, meet with them in the dark in places you don't know anything about. This country is full of perverts that are trying to get your kids. Is that enough said? Would you listen to me? You men that have a young daughter growing up, you'd better learn what it is to be a guardian. Real fast. You'd better find out that there's a bunch of old devils out there that want your kids. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you think I'm just being hyper, blowing stuff up, they'll steal your little girl and they'll take her out here and pimp her and sell her as a prostitute. Can you live? Could you live? Not knowing, first of all, where your child was. Secondly, she's out here being sold on the street by some pimp. Could you go to bed at night and live with that? You say, what kind of country do we live in, preacher? That's a good question, friend. That's why you need power. You need power. You need power. You need power to pray. You need power to be obedient. You need power. And if you don't have that power, you're just going to f- go with the flow and just take your kids and throw them to this culture and they'll consume them before your very eyes. Amen. Now let me get it straight with you. Everybody that's on Facebook or MySpace or Craigslist is not a pervert. That doesn't mean you're a devil or a hellion. But what it means is that if you are on there, you'd better be very careful what you're doing. For you may be making yourself vulnerable to a world out there that you don't even know exists. You're in a nice church house. You've got people sitting around you. Most of the people in here you can trust. Some of the people in here I wouldn't turn my back on. Why? I don't know them. I've lived 62 years. I've lived long enough to learn that until I know somebody and know them real good, until I know them real good, I'm not going to turn my back on you. Because I'm not going to trust you until I really know you. Know where you came from and what you're all about. So kids don't get this false sense of security to think that everybody's like the people here in Temple Baptist Church. There's some monsters out there that will consume you and destroy your life. Acts chapter number 2, the Bible said they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter number 3 and verse number 6, here's what happens when the power of God comes down on a believer. Here's what Peter said to the man lying at the gate. Impotent. Then Peter said... Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Oh boy. (laughs) My, my. 
Have you ever prayed that positively? And that assuredly? With that kind of confidence? Like this man did? Has God ever had you go off somewhere? With somebody on your heart? And tell you, you pray for so and so. You pray for them now. Stop what you're doing and start praying right now. Pray for them. Pray for them. The Apostle Peter in Acts chapter number 3, the Bible said, spoke to the man who was laid lame at the temple, and he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. What do you got, Peter? What did he have? I've got to ask that question. You say, and such as I have give I thee. Well, my friend, he had to have something then. If the Apostle Peter said, such as I have give I thee, what did he have? Well, I want you to notice carefully, he had a testimony. The Apostle Peter had a testimony. He didn't have my testimony. He didn't have your testimony. He didn't have one he got out of a book. He never got up and preached and gave a testimony being coached as to what to say. When the Apostle Peter preached, he preached from what he knew. Here is a man who fled from the Jews, who hid in the dark. And the cock crew to let him know that Jesus Christ knew exactly what he would do. But that night when he was gathered with the disciples, and the Son of Man showed up and breathed on them, and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. It was that same Apostle Peter that received something from the Lord he never had before. He had begun to receive things from God that he could give out. Let me put it this way to you. We talk about so-and-so has been called into the ministry. So-and-so is a minister. Do you know what it means to minister? There was a man who on the road to Jericho fell among thieves. The Bible says that they left him wounded and naked. And a Levi passed by. And a priest passed by. And passed by. But an old Samaritan came by. And he saw him lying on the side of the road. And he went over to him and the Bible said he poured in oil and wine. Who told him what that man needed? Maybe he had been lying on the side of the road somewhere. Maybe this old Samaritan that treated this man who fell among thieves was giving him what he himself at one time had received. You see, this is the most classic clearest, plainest case of ministry in all the Bible. He was ministering what he had received. He was giving what he had had. Do you know why you don't minister to people? Do you know why you give out empty words and religious platitudes? And and I mean, you learn them after a while. It's because you've never received anything from God where you can give it to somebody else. Do you know why a drug addict makes a good minister to drug addicts? Do you know why? It's because that drug addict knows what it is to be forgiven and feel the power of God. And then maybe sometime down the road, slip back, go back, and realize that the flesh is powerful and have a backsliding session for a while. This same man that wrote me the letter from southern Florida said, I got saved and God delivered me and I felt the power of God in my soul and I lived for the Lord. But then he said, I started working on the weekends. And he said, it interfered with my church going. And he said, I made a mistake one day. Somebody gave me a pain pill. And he said, that's all it took. He said, when they gave me a pain pill, he said, it got me right back into it. And he said the first thing, and he said it was just a matter of days. He said, I was a full-blown addict again. He said, well, how could that be, preacher? I may tell you something, friend. Don't you know how powerful your flesh is? Religion will paint up, pretty up, powder puff, make excuses for the flesh. The Word of God and the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ will put it to death. And that's the only way to deal with it. He said though, here's what he said. Now you listen to what I'm saying. 
He said, I went uh, some time like that, back in drugs, but I knew I was saved. And I knew it was wrong. But I couldn't do anything about it because I'm a slave to my flesh without the power of God. Then he said that he got in a, in a, claw, in a, in a, in a hotel, motel room somewhere. He said he got on his face. And he said, Lord God, help me. Lord Jesus, you've got to be real and alive. Help me. He said he came to him in that hotel room. He said he touched him. He said he broke the power of that. He said he broke that power from him. He was able to get up from there and shake that off. But he said that his joy, his fellowship, and all of that didn't, didn't just return all of a sudden. He said he went to church, started listening to the Word, and he started praying for God to give him his joy back and for God to give him his power back. And you know what he said? And I hope I don't mess it up, but I want to tell it as near as I can remember it. He said, and started hearing me preach. And this is not for me. This is the Word. Where God made you free. He doesn't set you free. He makes you free. He said he sat down at his office. And he said he felt something come down upon him. That literally moved his heart. Where he could begin to repent. Pour out his soul to God. For what he'd done. The restoration was by stages. He poured out his soul. He said, God gave my tears back to me. He gave me repentance back. He said, when repentance came back to me, He said, I poured my soul out to God. He said, when I poured my soul out to God, He said, the joy came back in. So the Lord broke the power of drugs the second time. Then progressively, He brought him back into a spiritual relationship with Him by cleansing the inner man, by giving him repentance. Oh, what a blessed gift it is to repent. Oh, what a wondrous thing to repent. Oh, what a blessedness to repent. Some of you got hell hanging on you and you can't even get a tear up. Some of you have done stuff you know, you know that it's an abomination and yet you, you just can't do anything about it. You feel no remorse. That's no repentance. You can't work up repentance. Repentance is the gift of God. It's crying out to the one that saved you and saying, Lord, work a work in me. How will my heart broken? How will my tears flowing? How will it get right? And I want my joy back. And it came back. What he didn't know, what he was confirming to this old Baptist preacher that's been preaching for 32 years from this pulpit, what I already knew in my soul. I've dealt with people, bringing them back by stages. And see them get a victory here and a victory there. And then all of a sudden, watch the spiritual power flow into their soul. And see them shout and rejoice. When that repentance comes back. Oh, what is repentance? Somebody said, well, all it is is changing your mind. How many of you believe that's all there is to repentance? Oh, I know the word means a change of mind, but there's a lot that precipitates a change of mind. It's based upon something that has power in it. The Gentiles began to get right with God, Brother Peach. Yep. The Jew says, and to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance. It's almost as if they were saying, My! Look at them! They're on their face! They're crying out to God for their fornication, for their drunkenness, for their idols. And the Jews said, We cannot deny this. They're crying out to our God. We cannot deny it. Repentance is a powerful thing. Have you ever had repentance, dear friend? Well, preacher, my preacher told me that if you believe the gospel, that repentance is included in belief. Oh, is it now? Would you quote me chapter and verse for that? Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Let me tell you how it worked with me. The night that I bowed my head and said, God, 
be merciful to be a sinner. And God saved me was at the end of about four or five days of pure hell. I couldn't make it any longer. I was under conviction so strong that I knew at any moment I'd be in hell. Conviction precedes repentance. Repentance is the fruit of conviction. I was hell bound. Man, I was hell bound. And I carried that with me as long as I could hack it. And you brought a man in there and sat down next to me and read the Word of God. And I was saying in my soul, hurry up. I was. He wouldn't lead me anywhere. I was ready. And he looked at me and said, are you willing to have the Lord Jesus come into your life and believe on Him? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, let's pray. And we prayed, and when we prayed, I felt somebody come down inside me. That conviction lifted from me. And in my heart, I began to pour out to God what a dirty, rotten, stinking piece of filth I was. But in the same time, I felt joy and power and glory coming into me. And God saved me right there. But for the next two or three weeks, I've told you before, I'd go to work and open my toolbox up, pull a car in there and jerk the hood up and start to work on that thing. And I'd bend in there and be jerking a plug or a distributor or something out of it. And something rolling on my soul. Something began to roll down upon me and remind me of where I come from and what I used to be. And I'd say, God, Lord, forgive me of this. God, help me. Knowing all the time I'd already been saved. He was purging, cleansing, emptying. I mean, I did some repenting. You'll do far more repenting after you get saved than you ever did before you got saved. Amen. I'm sure some of those mechanics thought I was crazy. I'm sure they did. I'd tune one up, jump in that thing, take out the door, and man, here I'd go. I'd road, you have to road test the car when you tune it up. I'd take that thing out after I'd tuned it up and out on the highway I went. I'd get out there and start praising God and glorifying God and roll that window down and say, Hallelujah! I'm saved! Glory to God. Oh man, I had something. Still do. It's repentance. Repentance. I let a word go out of my mouth last night. And I was amazed I said it. It, was a it wasn't a cuss word, but it was a descriptive term that I shouldn't have used. And the minute it got out of my mouth, I mean the very second it left my mouth, I said, God, forgive me for this. I said, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Oh, I felt something come over me like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I had no peace until I said, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I'm sorry. Some of you use that word every day of your life. But he wouldn't let me get away with it. The minute it came out of my mouth. And boy, I'm telling you right now. Conviction hit my soul. Just like that. I'm thankful though. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I am. I'm glad. I'm glad there wasn't any interval. I'm glad nobody had to come up and tell me they didn't like that little term I used. I'm glad I didn't have somebody have preached to me and tell me. I'm glad it hit me immediately and I'm glad, thank God, I said forgive me right now, right here. I said that for about a minute or two. I couldn't get any peace. Oh God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for this. Forgive me. And then forgiveness like the power of God. I mean like the power of God. The power of God. I said, it's okay now, son. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've never confessed it again. It's over with. It's finished. It's like that. Who do you think I'm talking about? Who am I talking to? What kind of God? What kind of a God do we serve? Came down. It's okay, son. It's gone. <laughs> I said, Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> hallelujah! <laughs> and it was. If it's ever brought up again, I'll say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Because <laughs> it was gone. 
Now, for the sake of some of you, it's not a four-letter word. It's not some gutter talk. It's just something he wouldn't let his preacher say. I guess he has to hold me to a standard. Yes, he does. And he lets me know that standard. And he lets me know that standard. He holds me to it. <laughs> he does. That's okay. That's okay. He holds me to it. By the grace of God, I'm not grappling and complaining. I'm rejoicing. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Then when I got up this morning, blessed Savior, Lord Jesus. What is it, son? <laughs> I said, Blessed Father, Holy One, what is it, Son? <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I don't know how long I could make it if I did some vile thing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm capable of it. We're all capable. But the Holy Ghost came down in Acts chapter number 2 in the power of God where He holds us to a standard He doesn't hold this world to. You're held to a higher standard. You're held to a higher standard than the Old Testament saint was held to. Ain't none of you God let get away with a thousand wives. Not a one of you. He holds you to a higher standard, a greater standard, a purer standard. The reason? Because you're sons of God by the new birth. You've been born again. The Holy Ghost is in you. I can hear something and feel something die in me. That's the Holy Ghost. He's grieving. He's grieving. I can walk into a place. The minute I walk through the door, I know I'm not supposed to be there. Not know before you go in, but the minute you walk in, the Holy Ghost is saying, get out of here. This is not your place. Yes, Lord. And get out. Amen. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. God spoke to somebody. I didn't go where I was planning on going. But I've got to go where God takes me. And I knew I'd have to confess that. I knew I'd have to confess it. And I did it for the glory of God. I did it for the glory of God. How many of you carrying something now and you won't confess it? You know what happens, don't you? If you don't confess, your heart starts hardening. The Holy Ghost doesn't produce conviction in you. See, conviction came to me just like that. It no sooner got out of my mouth, I was convicted. If you want to walk with Him, walk in fellowship with Him, live for Him, commune with Him, He'll mark every step you take, and the moment you do something wrong, He'll let you know it. And you can confess it, agree with the Holy Ghost, and continue to walk in communion and fellowship. That's the Christian life. You don't have to let it build up on you like some insurmountable obstacle or some burden that you can't handle until you're beaten down and you don't know what to do. And then you begin to wonder, has God saved me? Is it real? What you need to do is to come down to Him this morning and say, Lord God, I don't have any repentance and I don't have any tears, but I want some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. It's been a long time since you spoke to me. And I can take you right back to the spot where you stopped talking to me. And it was my choice to make that day. And I chose to rebel and stop listening to the voice of God. That happens, doesn't it? He'll take you to the spot. I can take you to the place I got saved. I sure can, boys. I can take you to the spot. And I can take you to the spot where the power of God and the glory of heaven fell on my soul. Right up there. I can take you to the spot. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, use what I said for the glory of God. Use it for the glory of God. I don't let a bunch of stuff pile up on me. I don't want to harden my heart to you. I don't want to turn away from you. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want my stubbornness and my rebellion, my foolishness to stand between me and thee, Lord. I want to know, Father, I'm walking in fellowship and communion with you. And that at any moment, if I say something, do something wrong, I want to know right then. I want to know it's wrong, and I'm going to confess it by the grace of God right then. And keep walking. Hallelujah. Keep walking. Glory to God. Keep walking. In thy holy name I pray. Anybody here this morning, raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me because I have no tears. And I have no conviction, but I need it. 
I want it. God bless you right there. God bless you. God bless you back here. I need tears. I need conviction. God bless you back here. I need to repent. And I know I do, but I don't have it in me to repent. God bless you back here. Cry out to Him. Cry out to Him. He's a good God. Folks, He's a good God. If He wanted to send us to hell, man, it would be anybody here this morning. If God was against you, you wouldn't breathe another breath. God's for us. And if God's for us, who can be against us? God's for you. He's not against you. He's not waiting for you to mess up so He can club you to death. He wants to help you. But He won't live a lie with you. You'll walk in truth. You'll walk in truth. That means you'll walk in the light. And if you walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Father, in Jesus' name, I prayed for those who raised their hand. Maybe some folk down here in this altar this morning. Lord God, it's between them and you. Maybe they're crying out right now for repentance. They're crying out for conviction. They're crying out. They know their heart's cold. It's stone cold. It's stone cold. And it scares them. God, it scares them because they're doing things now that they know are wrong and they don't feel convicted for it. And it's bothering them. And cry out to thee and ask you to send conviction. Ask you to send your spirit. Ask you to move in their heart. Ask you to break that cold heart. Ask you to warm their soul. Ask you to move in where hell has taken place. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, Jesus' sake I pray. Blessed be the name of the Son of God.